Greetings from Prora, which is an architectural manifestation of Nazism's example to the future. There was no such thing as a Nazi style of building, but there was such a thing as a Nazi size of building, and it was vast, XXXL and then some. Prora was Europe's first industrialized holiday resort begun in 1936 and unfinished at the outbreak of war. So never inhabited by the 20,000 Aryan gods and breeder goddesses for whom it was intended. Its legacy is unmistakable. This is the prototype of the slummy hutches that were erected all over Europe 25 years later by the package tour industry. It was National Socialism that showed the entire continent how to trash its coastline. Specifically, it was the party's leisure organisation, Strength Through Joy. Strength Through Joy was the brainchild of the national cheerleader, Robert Lai, who named a cruise ship after himself and who hanged himself with a towel in his cell at Nuremberg. His big maxim was, there are no private individuals anymore. Lai's notion of leisure, for anyone other than himself, was compulsory communal games, compulsory communal walks, compulsory lectures in Germanic culture, compulsory communal gymnastics. All this suited the tragically obedient German people with their taste for all that is compulsory and all that is communal. It was a golden age for the joiner in, for the sycophant and the sneak. In many regards, the Third Reich was like a hearty, outdoorsy cadet club, a nationwide scout troop. Hitler was an architectural dabbler whose initial enthusiasm had been for the Baroque. A magnificent prospect, isn't it? But under the influence of Alfred Rosenberg, another failed architect, he developed an obsession with ancient Greece and with the Greek revival of the early 19th century. He declared that the Germans were Nordic Greeks and that Greeks were Aryans. He had motifs from the Parthenon on his cutlery in order to symbolize his deep inner union with Greek antiquity. This devotee of symbolic teaspoons was also enthralled to Imperial Rome because the Romans had been, yes, Aryan and Nordic. Furthermore, neoclassicism was also associable with the only period when German architecture had been preeminent in Europe. That was the period of Schinkel, of Speit, of von Klenzer. Neoclassicism is susceptible to giantism and sheer size is something that Hitler valued over the niceties of style. It is also free of the hints of vulgarity that inform the Baroque and Hitler possessed the watercolorist deference to middlebrow good taste. Von Klenzer's Valhalla was an important precursor, not only neoclassical, not only la... <laughs> not only neoclassical, not only grave, not only large, but a shrine to German heroes. In whatever country it was found, this kind of neoclassicism was a dim, middle-of-the-road style. And so it remains, save in Germany, where it is contaminated by association. It is perhaps not impertinent to amend Hannah Arendt's memorable phrase and talk of the banality of evil buildings. And every building possessed a symbolic as well as a utile purpose. There was nothing complicated about this. Every building symbolised the state. National Socialism was persistently vain. It existed in order to celebrate itself and to exhort its subjects to celebrate it. The German people were force-fed a diet of swastikas, eagles, vastness.
Over and again, they were faced with exhortations in the shape of bloated statuary. It represented the perfected race that Germans were on the way to becoming, a race of imbecilic, genitally impoverished bodybuilders. How are they going to breed? Nazism was, however, as imaginatively wanting as it was morally deficient. Emulation could only be conceived of in terms of mimicry. Hitler was forever planning for eternity, but eternity was going to look like 2,000 years ago. enough.
Now, the use of propaganda and the willingness to reshape history is hardly unique to the government of Vladimir Putin and what's going on over Ukraine right now. In fact, the modern art of propaganda reached new heights or depths back in the 1930s by Adolf Hitler when the Nazis, when they declared war on modern art itself. An extraordinary exhibit at the Neu Gallery here in New York City is drawing huge crowds to see the kind of artwork that the Nazis admired hanging side by side with the kind they despised, what they called degenerate art. The acclaimed historian Simon Sharma took me on a tour and he offered a chilling reminder that first they came for the art and then they came for everyone else. What is degenerate art? Well, degenerate art was a response to the city, to the modern city above all. It had corrupted the ancient innocence of the German farmer, the stocky guildsman. If you think about all those Wagnerian operas, not just of mythical figures with cattle horns on their helmets, but also noble townsmen in poetry and singing competitions. So degenerate art presupposes there was health in the past, and it was the Nazis' job to be the ultimate political doctors, to restore that health. And the art bit of that were these beefy classical bodies. I mean, it's a very physical ideology, Nazism. And we walked through the galleries to see exactly what Simon meant. Simon, this is the kind of art that they liked, that he liked, that the Nazis, yeah. this kind of heroic, very representational art. Yes, exactly. Sort of Nazi beefcake, really, actually. Um, <laughs> you know, sort of soldiers and sailors doing magnificent things. Although the stormtrooper... Very fascist. I mean, that's very yeah, fascist. Yes, incredible. Well, actually, this style, it has to be said, was, you know, not dissimilar from what you would see in the Soviet Union, either. These immense kind of, you know, bicep, testosterone surging Nazis, really. What, what Hitler liked, what, what he hated, was really what he thought was the literal deforming of art by modernist taste. So this room is about the contrast. Even the wall is painted a different colour. What are we looking yes. at here? Well, you're looking at the triptych that hung over Hitler's fireplace. This is called the Four Elements, otherwise known as for waitresses with the chamber pot, really. But it's an example of the clinical, sanitised uh, perfection which Hitler really wanted. This, on the other hand, you know, just look at them. I mean, one is absolutely glowing with invention and creativity. It's full of an engagement with the 20th century, but done in a new painterly language. By the way, all the, all the artists, very, very few, were actually Jewish. They were deemed to be, there were signs in the exhibit saying, Yiddish view of farmers. Even if you weren't Jewish, you could be Jewish in the mind. I think the sort of the, the extraordinary thing was that so he secretly, on yes, absolutely, secretly, of course, many of the Nazis, not Hitler, did love this stuff. Actually, I mean, I liked it did enough to, to hide it away. Almost certainly, they did. So tell me, because there were these exhibitions, these competing yeah, well, exhibitions. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> two million people went to see the so-called degenerate art exhibition, and we don't have, you know, obviously very frightened to say, ooh, I, I came to hate and I exited loving it, but obviously, you know, <laughs> really, you don't, you don't queue for hours and hours just in order to be disgusted. You, <laughs> you want to have a good time. And this was three times the number of people who went to see the rival exhibition of great German art, you know. So it was sort of propaganda disaster, really. And yet it was criminally effective. Actually, even though it was not factually true that modern art was a Jewish plot, like Jewish medicine and psychoanalysis were literally a kind of poison inside the body of Germany. To that extent, probably people who didn't go and see the show, but who listened to what it was meant to represent, that contributed to the horrible dehumanization of the Jews. What about Hitler particularly himself? made him go on. Look, we all read that Hitler was a good artist. No, 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 he's an absolute terrible artist, but you really do wish 
that they'd let him into the Vienna Art School because he might not have been so traumatically alienated. No, we'll never know. No, so he was a horrible artist. There were traditional academic German artists who were nondescript. If only Hitler had been merely nondescript, you know, he might actually have got into the Vienna School. But do you think his attack on modern art, so-called degenerate oh, was art, profound. was because of his own ship? Yes, yes, no, he carried on painting. You know, there are two painters fighting the Second World War, Churchill and Hitler. Um, if I go to actually award Churchill, not a great artist, but much less terrible than, you know, if they could have fought it out with their brushes, you know, maybe the world would have been a more peaceful place. Maybe so. This exhibition is being hung at a time when we're in the anniversaries, 100 years of World War I, 70 years of World War II, but also at a time when we see propaganda fueling the fires of yet another war in Europe, for instance, in Russia, Ukraine. What is the danger of playing around with this kind of culture? Well, I think, you know, there, there are two views. One, one is that really all art should be an obedient slave of ideology, um, that nothing is more important. Arts, you know, all, all great art is made out of a sense of imaginative rebellion. And also, often, the role of modern artists is to make you not sleep very well at night. It's supposed to trouble you, to stir you up, to see things anew. Fanatical ideologies, whether they're religious ideologies or totalitarian ideologies, don't really like that. I'll tell you something else, Christian, that, you know, very often the masters of that fanatical view say, well, ordinary people don't like modern art. They don't understand it, they don't get it, they hate it. It's all a conspiracy of a snobby elite. Well, it, museums like MoMA here in New York or the Tate Modern in London or Pompidou in France give the lie to that because millions upon millions of millions of people who never would go through the door of a museum of boring classical art can be seen pouring through the turnstiles. They well, love it. They loved it they apparently love it. back in 1937 as they, well. Yes. So why is it important that this exhibition is hung today? Well, I think probably, you know, I mean, when actually walking through it, you look at these works and you have this extraordinary sense of the life force, of the greatness of German and other kinds of modernism created in explosive colour, real freedom of the human spirit. And, do you know, I kind of miss that right now in contemporary art. Contemporary art has become a branch of fashion now, and it's, it's lost, actually, that life force which is covers the walls there. Totalitarianism is not the enemy of art now. Mindless fashionability is the true foe. Simon Sharma, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure as always. do the CIA have in common with the likes of Jackson Pollock? I don't look at Jackson Pollock and see in those random splurgy lines um, a metaphor for the great rugged individualism of the United States of America. That's not what I see, but that's what the CIA wanted me to see and the audiences to see. Bizarrely, what's happening is that the CIA identify an American, an absolutely quintessentially American movement in aesthetics, which is being derided at home in America. And they decide, as a result of that, to, to protect it, to nurture it, to promote it and to export it abroad as a carrier for a positive idea about America and American freedom. Abstract Expressionism is often seen as the quintessential movement of modern painting, but there's a deep puzzle about it. How did its angst-ridden, dysfunctional artists, products of the deeply alienated urban scene, come to be used as servants of empire? You, you know, the United States has, has saved Europe, um, but so has the Soviet Union. You've got to remember that, that it was the Soviet Union that, without the Soviet Union, Hitler could not have been defeated. And the Soviet Union and 
Uncle Joe, the avuncular Uncle Joe image has been built up very carefully by European, especially British, propagandists. Mm. Um, and then that all has to be dismantled after the war because he's now the avowed enemy the, of the Cold War. Culture is terribly important. The weapons have been stood down for the time being. The two sides are looking at each other, you know, over the fence. And, and what they, they are fighting with initially, and it lasts the whole way through the Cold War, and in fact I would argue is the central sort of um, theatre of the Cold War, they're fighting with culture. And the thing you have to remember about the CIA is that there was a group of uh, Ivy League educated, quote unquote, liberal thinkers, intellectuals, people who could otherwise have been staffing, you know, the boards of universities and, and philanthropic foundations. And often there was a sort of enormous crossover between the two. And these people had a very um, sophisticated idea about modern art and modernism and what was happening in America. Opportunity with characters like Pollock to make modernism, to make the story of modern art an American story. And, and Pollock, by the way, is, is the hero who impersonates the nation. He comes in, you know, like some kind of screen cowboy through the bar doors at the Cedar Tavern and says, you know, I can paint better than anyone. And, and they get this perfect um, character, self-directed, individualistic, almost anti-establishment character. And that is this America's greatest living artist. This idea that this man uh, who's struggling with alcohol and, and chucking cans of paint round in a studio that's falling apart somewhere in the Hamptons, the idea that he is becomes the cherished vessel of American freedom, of the official, if secret, idea of American liberal freedom is, is so fantastic, you wouldn't credit it, you know, you just wouldn't think it's possible. But that's, that's what happens, and that's why the, the CIA thinking is very sophisticated. CIA people that I spoke to. New York in particular, but America was now the centre, the self-designated centre of modern art in the world. And you cannot be uh, great politically without great art. That's the model. That's the model that the CIA were following. You cannot be Venice without Tintoretto. You cannot be Florence without Giotto. You cannot be New York without Pollock. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying Pollock's to blame. I'm not saying that he was complicit. I'm not saying that that has anything to do with what was going on in Pollock's head when he was, or his soul, when he was making those paintings. And I'm, I'm simply saying that the way in which it, it merges into the sort of public consciousness across the world at a time when nobody else had any money to move this stuff around and to give it this kind of backing, that is historically linked to a Cold War, ideas about propaganda and, and psychological forms of persuasion and it's, it's, it's a fact, that's a fact. It's not a conspiracy theory, it's a conspiracy fact because we know from the documentation, from the interviews that have been done that this is what the CIA did. Hello and welcome to the Royal Academy and a superb exhibition devoted to abstract expressionism. Now abstract expressionism was an American art movement that started in the 1940s and it was an attempt I think by American art to gain independence from the European tradition, to find an art that was quintessentially American and big and bold. And one of its defining characteristics is that it was using abstract art, abstract paintwork, abstract colourings, instead of figuration. Now, when I say abstract expressionism was a movement, I'm perhaps 
casting it too precisely. It is actually more of a tendency, a gathering of like-spirited artists who are trying to change the direction of art. And that's why you can look at some abstract expressionist paintings, like the work of Barnett Newman, and it seems very minimalist and geometric and completely different, for example, from this thing I'm standing in front of, the great Blue Poles by Jackson Pollock, which is so full of life and energy. Different people have different emotions, and art needs to say different things about different places and different times. So abstract expressionism had different moods and different styles. This is the first room in the show, and it's devoted to the early work of the abstract expressionists. And it's also got in it some unexpected self-portraits. I mean, there's Mark Rothko wearing a pair of shades. So you're not quite sure if he's looking at you or you're looking at him. And here's something very unexpected. Look at that. Jackson Pollock as a teenager. Look how angsty and dark and existential he is. And right from the start, this show tells us new things about artists we thought we knew very well. Although all the stars of abstract expressionism are here, wonderfully represented, the Pollocks and the Rothkos, there are also a few less familiar faces, not because they're lesser artists, but because their work is harder to get and they're not seen as often. David Smith, for instance, who's the great sculptor of abstract expressionism, who worked on a, a farm and used this agricultural machinery which you cut up and reconfigure into these dynamic, outdoor, rustic metal pieces of art. I mean, he's in the middle of almost every room. But look over here. Arshili Gorky, the man who more than anybody else can be credited with starting abstract expressionism because he was the European who brought all that sense of surrealism and the past to New York in the 1940s. I mean, for me, this row of three pictures is probably the most gorgeous moment in the entire show. Amongst the dramatic loans that have been made and have come over here to the Royal Academy for the first time is this row of paintings by Willem de Kooning, who's the most figurative of the abstract expressionists, the one who's always compared with Jackson Pollock because his brushwork is so active and busy and cutting. I mean, these are some of the most famous works of American art. These pictures are as much about the painter as they are about the figure in them. They're about how charged and erotically powerful relationships are between men and women. So these are big truths that are being expressed here. And in a show packed with memorable loans, nothing is quite as impressive as this row of de Kooning's. So although de Kooning was such a busy painter and his pictures are so full of active brush strokes and slashes and drips, the other side of abstract expressionism, the cooler side, the more minimalist side, is represented best, I think, by the great Barnett Newman. But when you first see these, you think, oh, there's not much happening in them. There's just these famous stripes of his, these big fields of colour. This is art that affects you physically. It looms over you. It envelops you. It engages with your emotions, not by showing you action-packed sequences of painting, but by somehow entering your space. Another artist who gets a room to himself here is the great Clifford Still, who is perhaps lesser known in Britain. We simply haven't got enough great Clifford Still pictures here to make our minds up about him. But I think anybody coming to this exhibition will leave it thinking to themselves, Wow, Clifford Still, what a giant he was. I mean, the art is haunting, it's huge. It has a sense of grandeur to it. It evokes these sublime sensations. And its freshness, the fact that we haven't seen it so much, makes it, I think, among the highlights of a show that is packed with highlights. The exhibition finishes 
on a collection of paintings by Mark Rothko. Now, Rothko is one of those artists who we all know and I think most of us admire tremendously. But to see him installed so well here seems to me to bring a new sense of understanding to his work. All the way through this exhibition, you sense that it's addressing not just the past, but the present. This is an exhibition about a movement that happened before, but which tells us, I think, what some of our art is missing today. And what we're missing is this sense of depth, this profundity, and above all, I think, this sense of human emotion that you feel so tangibly with Mark Rothko. I mean, what is art if it isn't one person trying to communicate with another person about the emotions they're feeling? And here, amongst these gorgeous, floaty Rothkos, that's the memory that I will take away with me.